EPA Region 2. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for attending. This is our Regional Wetland Program Development Grants Training Workshop. Um, so it was a great interregional effort with our colleagues at Regions 1 and 3. Um, the presentation will be led by Jacqueline Woolard, our Regional Grants Coordinator, um, and she's going to get some help from Donna Smith-Williams from Region 1 and Danielle Algazi from Region 3. So before getting started, I just want to go over some ground rules. Um, so all microphones are going to be muted throughout the presentation. Um, as Jackie mentioned up front, we ask that you at some point please type your agency affiliation into the chat box. You know, we see a lot of names. Um, we don't see a lot of agency affiliations in there. Um, also, I'm, now that we're on the chat box, um, please type your questions in there as they'll be addressed during the Q&A session after the presentation. Um, we'll have three regional grants coordinators along with grant specialists from Region 2 here to answer any questions that you may have. So you have the experts here um, to provide their knowledge. Um, and we'll address questions in the chat box first and then use the raise hand function um, to answer questions uh, during that time as well. So the presentation is going to be recorded with captions and we will be available with a link sent to all registered and included in the request for applications um, later when that actually comes out. So with further, without further ado, um, I'd like to turn it over to Jackie Bullard from Region 2. Good morning, everybody. We're so glad you're able to join us today. Um, this has been a big effort between all three regions to get this training workshop put together. Um, we've had a lot of assistance from other presentations throughout EPA. I just want to give a quick shout out to EPA Region 10, um, Yvonne Vallette and Andrea Bennett. They had some slides put together for a previous presentation that were extremely helpful. Um, and they allowed us to use some of their information. So just want to give a shout out to them and also shout out to all of my colleagues that have been just an immense help getting this put together. So we, we hope you enjoy and we hope it's full of a lot of great information. Um, I have my camera on so you can see what I look like, but I'm going to turn it off here in a minute just to um, try to prevent any technical difficulties because I'm sure we all are familiar with those on Teams. So do you mind going to the next slide, Marco? So here's just a quick overview of our agenda. Um, the meeting will run from 10 to noon. Uh, the first part of the presentation, I will be covering the EPA wetlands programs, the wetland program development grants, reading the request for applications for the grants, submitting to grants.gov. Then we'll take a quick break. And when we come back at 11, Danielle Algazi from Region 3 is going to cover understanding competitive grants, application forms, budget and match requirements, and um, a little bit on the grant management roles. And then at 11.30, we will have our Q&A session. So as, as we go along, if you have questions, um, please type them in the chat box. We will be compiling those questions to um, address at the end of the presentation um, as, a, as a whole, rather than trying to, trying to break things up and um, do it that way. It's probably just easier to do it all at the end. So please feel free at any time to type in a question to the chat box. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, we'll get right into it. And I'm going to turn my camera off. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of background information for those that are less familiar with, with EPA's wetland program and the wetland program development grants. So the goal of EPA's wetland program includes increasing the quantity and quality of wetlands in the United States by conserving and restoring wetland acreage and improving wetland condition. To pursue these goals, EPA seeks to develop the capacity of all levels of government to develop and refine effective, comprehensive programs for wetland protection and management. Next slide. In order to achieve these goals, in 2007, EPA launched the Enhancing State and Tribal Programs Initiative. I just want to make a note that here in Region 2, we do have both Puerto Rico and the United States Virgin Islands in our region. So I apologize to those that do not have enhancing state territory and tribal programs, um, but it's just a little bit too long of a name. So the goals of the um, ESTP initiative are to increase dialogue between EPA and our states, territories and tribal nations on wetland program development, provide clear articulation of program building goals and activities defined within the core elements framework, Align the wetland program development grants with program development activities in the CEF, which is the core elements framework, and provide targeted technical assistance for states, territories, and tribal nations. Next slide, please. 
So like I just said, the four key components of the ESTP initiative are the core elements framework, wetland program plans, technical assistance, and the wetland program development grants, which we will be covering in depth today, but I just want to give a little bit of background on some of the other key components. Next slide, please. So the core elements framework, this is a document that is the foundation of the Enhancing State and Tribal Programs Initiative. The four core elements are monitoring and assessment, regulatory, wetland water quality standards, and voluntary restoration. And under each of these four core elements, there is a comprehensive list of actions and activities. Um, I guess I should say goals, then objectives, then actions, then activities to help you reach those objectives and goals. It's supposed to be, you know, the, the, the goal of it was to be laid out in a logical fashion so that if you follow the steps, um, you know, you don't have to hit every step, but if you follow the steps in the core elements framework, eventually you will have a very strong, comprehensive and effective wetland program plan. The core elements framework also provides clarification and prioritization of all of these activities and describes core program elements and provides a list of potential, potential program building activities. This is a great place to look if you need ideas or if you are kind of stuck in, in what to do next to develop your wetland program. This is a wonderful, wonderful um, resource to become familiar with. Next slide, please. So wetland program plans, um, some of you are familiar with these. You have submitted them to EPA for review and approval, and, and some of you may not be so familiar. So wetland program plans are optional three to five year plans developed by a state, territory, or tribal nation. Um, EPA doesn't really have any hand in the development of the, the plan unless you need assistance. Um, this is your plan and it's optional, but we highly encourage um, we highly encourage people to to develop a wetland program plan because it helps you strategically plan and explain your actions towards developing a wetland program in a logical and um, you know a strategic way it, it, it's supposed to be beneficial for both yourself and for EPA. Generally, these plans are consistent with the core elements framework, but you don't have to cover all four core elements. In addition, you can add other elements. A lot of a lot of organizations add things such as outreach and education or, um, you know, they have a, a separate climate change section of their uh, wetland program plan with actions and activities to reach their goals and objectives for climate change. So it's generally follows the core elements framework, but doesn't have to follow it directly. And like I said, these plans are helpful for you, but they're also helpful for us to prioritize and deliver both technical and financial assistance. Next slide, please. So that brings us right into the Wellland Program Development Grants. Just for ease and so we don't trip over our words, we're just going to call these the grants throughout the rest of the presentation um, since we're only talking about one one funding type here. It's the Competitive Regional Wetland Program Development Grants Program through EPA. The statutory authority is Clean Water Act Section 104B3. Wetland Program Development Grants provide a unique opportunity to develop and refine comprehensive state, territory, tribal, and local government wetland programs. Um, again, these are meant to develop the capacity to increase the quantity and quality of wetlands in the United States by conserving and restoring wetland acreage, which you may remember is, is one of the main goals of EPA's wetland program. Generally, the wetland program development grants um, use one or more of the core elements to achieve this goal. And just an, a reminder, one of the ESTP key components is to align the wetland program development grants with development actions and activities within the core elements framework. Next slide, please. So just some basics on the wetland grants. It's a biannual regional competition. It occurs in the odd years, so spring 2021 this year, and then the next one will, will be 2023. 
not everybody is eligible to apply. Um, the eligibility is open to states, territories, tribal nations, local governments, intertribal consortia, interstate agencies, and state universities. Um, unfortunately, non-governmental organizations, nonprofits, private consulting firms, and private universities are not eligible to apply for funding. However, that does not mean that you are exempt from becoming a sub-grantee or, or receiving a sub-award through, um, you know, like a state Department of Environmental Protection or through a, a Department of Transportation. They will get into sub-awards a little bit later. So the funding varies by the size of the region. Uh, region one has region one and three both have many more states than region two. We just have New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands and eight tribal nations. So the funding varies a little bit depending on, on geographic size. Here in region two, I believe our cap is around 1.4, but I believe the other regions are a bit higher. The funding amounts vary for each project. Um, they could be, they could even be lower than 70,000, but generally the awards are between 70 and up to as high as 800,000. We, in region two, we don't generally have awards that are, that are that high, but it's not unheard of. You need to provide a 25% match requirement. Um, there are a couple of exceptions. Um, which we will also get into a little bit more later. The typical project length is two to three years with the opportunity for extensions if necessary or um, you know, all, all the flexibility is usually that are awarded with grants. We do offer no, no cost time extensions if needed um, and, and things like that. Next slide, please. So you certainly want to make sure you pay attention to which projects are eligible to be funded by the wetlands grants. So only program development or refinement activities are eligible. This includes demonstration, but does not include implementation. A couple of, a couple of examples that we see pretty often are mapping and monitoring projects, identification and prioritization of management areas, developing or refining a wetland program plan, and developing outreach training materials. Like I said, an implementation projects or projects designed to carry out a task rather than transfer knowledge are not eligible under this program. So these would be sort of, you know, one off one time type projects that are um, not experimental or demonstration in nature, but they're just, you know, um, a one time restoration project that doesn't qualify as demonstration that would not be eligible. Um, tasks required by a pending permit, Clean Water Act 404, 402, or 401, those would not be eligible. And wetland creation and construction are not eligible unless they have the demonstration slash experimental element to it. And generally, you would need a, a quite a comprehensive monitoring plan and you would have to really explain how your um, how your project is a as a demonstration rather than just a one time implementation. Next slide, please. So the wetland program plans and the wetland program development grants are linked within the RFA. There is a I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself a little. The RFA is the request for applications, which we'll get to here in a couple of slides, but within the request for applications, it provides explanation on how either having or not having a wetland program plan relates to the grants competition. So if you have a wetland program plan approved, or if you're developing, updating, or refining a wetland program plan, you will be placed into track one and you will be evaluated against all other track one applicants. And in track one, it's only the applicants are only states, territories, and tribal nations. In track two, the applicants include states, territories, tribal nations, plus local governments, interstate agencies, intertribal consortia, and state universities. Track two is for applicants that do not have 
a wetland program plan or not developing or refining one. However, you can reference one or more eligible ac actions from an EPA state approved state or tribal wetland program plan. But I definitely recommend reading um, reading into the track one and two concepts because when you apply, you will have to choose which track you submit your application to. So I highly recommend reading this section and determining which track you fit into. And one last thing, um, usually the regions divide the money a little bit differently between track one and two. So most of the times track one gets about 60% of the total funding available and track two receives about 40% of the funding. Next slide, please. OK, so now we get to the request for applications. This is a, I believe it's 30 something pages long document that is attached to the funding opportunity on grants.gov and is also posted on the EPA Well and Program Development Grants website. The request for applications is a document that you will want to read front to back as many times as possible because it is extremely dense with information and nearly every word in there is important to know and to remember. So I'm just going to briefly go over some of the sections. I'll spend a little bit more time on section four. The first three sections, funding opportunity, award information, and eligibility information cover things such as the program objectives, environmental results, priority areas, and the track one and two concept. It also includes the amount of funding available, information on contracts and sub awards, and eligible applicants, eligible activities, ineligible activities, and cost and cost share and match requirements. Next slide, please. So section four, I mean, all sections of the RFA are extremely important, but section four is particularly important and contains information that should be read very carefully. In this section, you will find the online address to download the application package. All applications must be submitted through grants.gov. The RFA does allow for hard copy grant submissions in limited circumstances, such as limited or no internet access. And you will, if, if this, if you fall under this category, if you have limited or no internet access, you may request a waiver to submit a hard copy of your grant application, but you definitely want to request this waiver as soon as you know you may need it. Um, minimum, I think, is 15 days before the end of the um, application period, but I definitely would recommend requesting a waiver as soon as possible if you think you'll need it. It also includes submission instructions, including registering for grants.gov and the requirements to do so as well as the hard deadline for submitting applications. The application materials section contains a list of all the mandatory components of your application, as well as some optional inclusions. And the following section, content of application, goes into these components in greater detail, including the correct order of documents and all of the things you should include in your project narrative. So regarding the content of application submission section, this outlines all application and submission requirements in great detail. It includes detailed requirements for the project description, project tasks, milestones, budget, etc. It also includes guidance on formatting, the strict page limit, application submission instructions, assurance and certifications, funding restrictions, and other submission requirements. Content section is very important as incomplete applications and those that do not follow the directions will be rejected. That is a difference between the last two competitions and, and previous ones. We are calling for full application. So if your application, including your project narrative and all of your forms are not complete, um, unfortunately your application will be rejected. So please, please pay attention especially to section four, especially to this content of application submission section. It's, it's very, very important. Next slide, please. 
I guess one last thing on that last slide, I just want to say it also includes um, communications and how to communicate with your grants coordinator in, in your region and sort of, you know, what to do if you need to contact somebody. So these last few sections, application review information, administrative information, agency contacts and other, these cover a lot more information. Um, again, very important sections. It covers um, the section five covers the review criteria, which is something you really want to pay attention to because it is how your application will be scored. So you want to make sure you're hitting all those criteria points as thoroughly as possible. But remember, you must adhere to the page limit. So um, it also goes into a little bit of the additional factors for funding decisions. Some of these include um, geographic distribution, the diversity of projects. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. So some of the other sections, award information, it just includes EPA's process for notifying applicants who both received funding and those who did not. Also includes administrative and policy requirements, reporting and dispute resolution. Uh, section seven is your agency contacts. That would be um, myself, Jacqueline Willard, Donna Smith Williams in region one and Danielle Algazi in region three. And then section eight other includes information on quality assurance and quality control, invasive species control, wetland mapping standards and adherence to EPA's geospatial data policy. So all great sections, a ton of information. Please read the RFA as many times as you can. Next slide, please. So just as a summary of the RFA, some key aspects to remember. You want to remember you want to identify any deadlines for application submission and the process for application submissions. You want to make sure you note all the important dates, write these down, memorize them, set reminders for yourself, whatever you need to do to make sure that you know when things are due and you're ready to submit when the time when, when the time comes. You certainly want to note any page restrictions for applications. A little bit later, we're going to get into some common mistakes that people make a lot during the competition. And um, I'll just make a note now that, that the page restriction is a very real requirement and um, applications have been rejected for not following the page, page limit. So you also want to identify allowable and non allowable activities. So this would be your your project eligibility. So you definitely want to pay attention to whether or not your project tasks can be funded by this by the wetlands grant program. And again, you really want to look at the scoring criteria and note the criteria that affect scoring the most. All all points are important, but you really want to make sure you're getting as many points as possible out of these summer out of some of these um, larger point categories. Just want to really, really look at the scoring criteria and use that to guide your proposal development. Next slide, please. I'm just going to pause for just one second, please. OK, so now we're going to go a little bit into the selection criteria. These categories are the categories that we use to evaluate your application. Each category has um, a number of points assigned to them. However, these are also all of the sections that you must include in your project narrative of your application. So some of the information on these next slides are going to be pulled from, pulled from the outline section of the RFA. Um, just highlighting some things in each section that are really important to include that are also part of EPA's evaluation process. Next slide, please. So project need, this is worth 15 points. You need to describe the need for your project as it pertains to developing or refining a wetland program. 
descriptions should include things like the threats affecting your aquatic resources, the needs for the actions that are proposed, how your outputs and outcomes will lead to increasing quality and quantity of wetlands, and any specific aspects of your geographic area that may cause adverse issues for your aquatic resources and explain how these issues will be addressed. Next slide, please. So the regional priority is worth five to 10 points. Um, some regions give five points, some regions give 10. That's why it's five to 10, but it always, you'll always end up with a maximum of 100 points. So if it's worth 10, then one of the other categories is worth fewer points. <clears throat> and there's not always a regional priority listed in the RFA, but there is if, if it's been determined that there is a sort of a large, larger need for, you know, a, a specific projects that that work on a, a focus area that the region is interested in. So some examples of past regional priorities include, uh, you know, climate change, sea level rise, environmental justice, regional specific aquatic resources, such as mangroves down in Puerto Rico, um, streams, vernal pools, etc and development of regional assessment tools for aquatic resources. It's likely that we will have regional priorities in, in the upcoming RFA, um, but we still are, we're still, in, we're still having those discussions internally. So, so be aware to look out for a regional priority. It will be clearly listed in the RFA. Next slide, please. Project tasks are also worth 15 points. You want to describe the tasks or components and the anticipated products outputs associated with each task. You want to define the steps you will take to meet your project outputs and outcomes and include a description of the roles and responsibility of your organization and other potential partners. It's important to include the plan development steps if you are planning to develop a, a new methodology or adapt an existing one you want to make sure you take a little bit of time and space to explain the steps of, of this process and how you're going to develop and then use the methodology. Next slide, please. Your milestones are worth 10 points. This is um, basically a schedule that covers each year of the project and budget period. So if you have a two-year project, you need to submit a milestone schedule that covers each year, uh, you want to include a breakout of project tasks into phases if possible, and add interim milestones if if that is also possible. You know, if you have a if you have one section that you know is going to take you have it a, it's going to take four months to complete, but you have some interim milestones that you could put in, you know, at the end of each month or, or halfway through. That that would help us, um, you know, just get a more comprehensive picture of your project schedule. You also want to include the anticipated dates for the start and completion of each task. And please consider an approach to ensure that your awarded funds would be expended in a timely and efficient manner. We we need to we need to see that. Um, we we know from a lot of past experiences, we know how how people have been with their previous awards, but in your application, please try to um, structure your schedule so that it shows EPA that you are did you, did you have the infrastructure and the readiness to complete this project in a timely and efficient manner. Next slide, please. Here's just an example of a milestone schedule. You have your main objective at the top and then some associated tasks underneath with uh, start and end dates. Again, here's what I mentioned about possibly including an interim goal. Um, you know, for this first task, you have a few different actions that you anticipate to take several months, but you know you may be done with the first action in the first month or two. So if you can, include these interim goals. And again, <laughs> you're not going to be held extremely strictly to these dates. It's just the more information you can provide, um, the more specific information you can provide, the better. Next slide, please. 
So I'll just go over this briefly because Danielle is going to go over the budget in more detail during her presentation later, but you certainly want to include a detailed budget. Um, this should include the estimated funding amounts for each project task. You must include both a budget table and a budget narrative to describe um, describe your costs and, and contracts if you have contracts. You also want to explain the contribution of required cost share match and make sure you describe your itemized costs in sufficient detail. Next slide, please. Transfer of results. This section is more important um, than it may seem because oh, you can see I added in here on, on this top line and forgot to change the font, but this last line here is, is quite important. So you want to describe your plans for how to actively transfer your project results, lessons learned, and or methods to other states, territories, tribal nations, or local governments and agencies within and beyond your own organization. So what we've seen in the past is people mentioning, you know, how they how they plan to do some outreach within their organization, but really the goal of the wetlands grants program is to accelerate wetland program development on a national scale. So if one person receives funding to develop something, we really we really discourage another application coming in to to do the same thing. You know what I mean? We we want to make sure that we are um, using this funding efficiently. So that's why transferring your results and sharing your outcomes, your lessons learned, this is a really big part of the wetlands grants program. And it's it just kind of helps to um, it just it just helps everybody across the board if you could share your results and some some examples of how to do this would be presenting at forums or scientific conferences, submitting map data, sharing and promoting results on a website, hosting field visits. Um, there's plenty of ways to transfer results. Um, just please, please pay attention to this section because you'll want you'll want as many points as possible for this section. Next slide, please. So your environmental results and tracking. This is the section where you will describe your outcomes and your outputs. So your outputs are your products and your deliverables for your grant. So this includes final reports, publications, maps and GIS files, or resource assessment tools. Your outcomes, these are your objectives or environmental improvements, such as increase in public awareness, improve regulatory protections, or streamlined permitting. And one thing that people sometimes miss in this is please link your outputs and your outcomes to EPA's just strategic plan. Um, this is a requirement of this section. Your outputs and outcomes should um, you know, link to EPA's strategic plan. If we go to the next slide, we can see what we're talking about here. So this is the goal and the objective from the strategic plan that the wetland grants are supposed to help achieve. Deliver real results to provide Americans with clean air, land, and water, and ensure chemical safety. Objective 1.2, ensure waters are clean through improved water infrastructure and in partnership with states and tribes, sustainably manage programs to support drinking water, aquatic ecosystems, and recreational, economic, and subsistence activities. So you want to link your outputs and outcomes to EPA strategic plan. Next slide, please. Programmatic capability and technical qualifications. This section is worth seven points. You need to describe both your organizational experience and your staff experience. Um, these can be, you know, for your organizational experience, can be a brief description of your experience related to the proposed project and your infrastructure readiness and ability to implement the proposed project in a successful and timely manner. For your staff experience, provide a key, a list of key staff, briefly describe ex expertise and qualifications relevant to the proposed project. And um, if you don't have the staff, um, 
please explain your ability to uh, obtain the necessary experience and qualifications, whether that's through hiring or contracting um, or some other way. If you if you need if you need that additional outside um, support, please make a note of that. Next slide, please. So partnerships, this is another important section that sometimes doesn't get as much attention as it should. So you certainly want to make sure you describe any agencies or organizations who will partner with you to achieve the project goals and objectives and accomplish the outputs and products. So provide a clear description of the roles and responsibilities of specific partners. If you're in the process of engaging a partner, you should describe how your plans to engage that partner and establish a working relationship to successfully complete the project. Um, there's a lot of information on partnerships in the RFA, not just in the content section or outline, but there are other places in the RFA where they describe partnerships in much greater detail. So make sure you, you know, even if you just have to control F and search the word partnerships, I would definitely make sure you uh, read every section possible that covers partnerships. Next slide, please. So your past performance. This is where you can submit a list of federally and or non federally funded assistance agreements within the last three years. You want to describe whether you were able to successfully complete and manage this agreement and how. Describe your history of meeting reporting requirements and describe the extent and quality to which you adequately and timely reported on progress. If you don't have any past grants or past reporting information, that's that's totally fine. It's not going to hurt your application. You'll receive a neutral score of four points if you don't have any past performance. However, if you do not include any information on your past agreements or indicate that you don't have any past agreements, you will receive zero points. So please, please, please indicate your past performance. And if you do not have past grants, please indicate that in your application. Otherwise, you may receive zero points for not addressing this section. Next slide, please. OK, so that's the review criteria and the um, content of your project narrative and, and things to really pay attention to. So if you're wondering if you should apply, these are some questions that would be important to ask yourself. So you want to make sure, have you read the RFA completely and carefully, and do you understand it? Is your organization eligible based on the eligibility criteria described in the RFA? This might be the first place you want to look, because if your organization is not eligible, please do not spend the time to develop a grant application. So please pay attention to the eligibility criteria. You also want to ask yourself if your organization has the technical expertise, personnel and financial capacity to successfully implement your project goals and expectations. Does your organization's mission align with the goals presented in the RFA? Do all stakeholders and leaders in your organization support applying for this grant? I know some, some agencies, organizations um, really discuss this internally and they have a, you know, kind of like a, a big grants work group that they put together and they discuss all the potential projects and they they judge whether or not there's support for the project and sometimes this can also help you identify places where you can possibly combine several different projects into one. So I certainly encourage um, engaging people in your organization and your leaders and your stakeholders to make sure that everybody's on the same page with applying for this grant. So it's a big responsibility if you if you are awarded. So make sure that you that you have the capacity and the uh, the green light to go ahead and apply. And lastly, you'll want to make sure your organization is prepared to do what it takes to successfully implement the project within the budget you propose. So if you could answer yes to these questions, then I think you are in great shape. If you can't answer yes to all of these questions, that does not mean that you should not apply. 
just these are just questions to consider. Um, this is, you know, like I said, this is a big, it's a big responsibility after you, if you do receive an award. So just make sure you're prepared. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm just going to quickly go through a couple of things on submitting to grants.gov and some things to look out for. So grants.gov is the website where you will um, complete your application, check for errors, save and submit, and um, yeah, submit your final application through grants.gov. Next slide, please. So I would recommend spending some time. If you've never applied before, or if you need a refresher, please spend some time clicking around the grants.gov website. There are more resources than I could even imagine on the grants.gov website. There are tutorials, PDFs, frequently asked questions. Um, there is a ton of information on grants.gov, more than we could ever cover here. So please spend some time clicking around the website and familiarizing yourself with the platform and the requirements. Next slide, please. So first thing, you want to create your account on grants.gov. You must have a registered account. I would recommend allowing at least up to a month for account creation. And this is because, you know, technical difficulties, glitches, um, not having everything you might need at the time. One thing that you absolutely need to register for an account is a data universal numbering system number. This is a unique number that is um, assigned to your organization that will follow you through the life of your grant application process and through the award management if you are selected. You also must have your organization registered at SAM.gov, which stands for Systems for Award Management. You have to have an active registration. However, both of these, receiving your DUNS number and the SAM.gov registration, both of these are free, as well as registering on, on grants.gov. So you don't have to pay anything. You just have to make sure you allow enough time. Sometimes registering for SAM.gov and getting your unique number, this could take up to a month to get these if you don't have them already. Another note is, please make sure your SAM.gov registration is current through at least September 30th, because that is when that's our deadline to get your awards out to you. And you must still be registered in the awards management system at that time. So please make sure that you have this registration and that it is active at least through the end of September. Um, you want to look at the submission requirements and build in time, not just for the submission, but the application process on grants.gov and make sure that your designated person with the grants.gov account will be available to submit the application on time. Uh, this might be a good time to block off on your calendar to make sure you don't accidentally take any time off or, um, you know, that you would be available to, to get this done during the allotted time. And the RFA, this person is sometimes um, referred to as the authorized organization representative. Next slide, please. So then you'll want to complete your application, including all required forms, assurances, and certifications. When you're finished, save a copy to your computer. Ideally, save two copies. Just make sure you have all of your completed information in a separate location other than just on grants.gov. You always want to make sure you have a backup. So you want to make sure your application elements, the project narrative, the forms, etc., are in the specified order listed in the RFA. This is important as well. You want to review the content and be sure you've addressed all the criteria that we use to score your application. Again, make sure you pay attention to those, those criteria pages and hit those points so you so you receive those points for your application. Next slide, please. Check for errors. Of course you want to check for errors. I personally have never submitted a grant to grants.gov, but I have been told that a check for errors button will appear um, when you are when you are finished and you want to click this button because this will 
Um, I, from what I hear, this will sort of go through your application and pull out anything that you may have missed or that's inconsistent and ideally have another staff member more than one review the entire application package for any errors and make sure things are consistent between your budget and just have somebody else review if possible next slide please and then you'll save and submit so only do this after you've double checked your application for accuracy completeness and compliance with the page limit once you submit once you hit send, your submission is final. If you have to make any corrections, you will need to resubmit your entire application. Make every effort to do this, to submit your final application at least 48 to 72 hours before the application deadline. If you can do it earlier, that is better. Next slide, please. Then just confirm your submission watch your email you'll receive emails from grants.gov um, confirming your submission and then in addition please email your epa regional grants coordinator just so we can make sure that what you submitted is showing up on our on our system on our end so that we make sure that there's no technical difficulties you know that your wi-fi didn't cut out right as you were hitting send um, just please email us. We can we can verify that it has been received. Next slide, please. I believe I believe this is the last slide before break. So just a couple of tips to wrap up uh, some of the things we just discussed. Describe the knowledge, staffing, and fiscal capacity the organization has in order to carry out the proposed project and meet the goals of the grant program. Include a budget using a realistic plan that aligns to the proposed goals and objectives and include a narrative that justifies the costs. Be concise and precise in describing your proposed grant. Make sure you adhere to the page limit. This is very important. You will hear this over and over today. You'll also want to include the need for the activity that the grant will support as well as your organization's track record and clearly show how you plan to achieve the purpose of the grant program and if possible provide supporting info and data some of the supporting info and data that you could submit is not included in the page limit so pay attention to that as well and if it's not included in the page limit please submit additional supporting information we we would love to see as much information as you have to share that will clearly articulate your project goals and objectives and with that i believe we are at our first break. So um, please take please take the next you know eight nine minutes or so to stretch grab some coffee. Um, if you have any questions type them into the chat box uh, for those that have joined um, maybe in the middle of presentation please type your organization affiliation into the chat box as well just so we can capture that information and uh, we will begin again at 11. Thank you.
Hi, I just wanted to chime in real quick. Um, I mentioned that at the break we would get the uh, names and organizations of the people on the phone. Um, so hopefully you could hear me now. I've got, I think we have two call-ins. One is 609-206-2837. If you are there, do you mind giving your name and organization? Okay, how about 518-391-4565? If you're there, do you mind giving your name and organization? Okay, well, we will we'll try to capture those numbers um, a little bit later. Thank you. Hey everyone, this is Danielle Algazi. We'll begin in about a minute to get back from our break. Okay, I think I'm going to get started from the break. I know that that was a, a really great uh, time to have a little break. My name is Danielle Algazi and I work in Region 3 in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, a lot of you know me as the lead for the Enhancing State and Tribal Program in my region, and I work in the Wetlands Branch under the Water Division. And I wanted to um, just give a shout out to Jackie, who did a fantastic job. Um, we uh, really appreciate and what Region 2 has done to put this presentation and this training together. And she really took the lead to get y'all registered and organizing. And um, I, we really appreciate that in Regions 1 and 3. Um, I also happen to be a senior project officer. And I hope that will help um, in assisting you uh, with learning about the requirements that EPA has in organizing a competition and review of applications. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of background on that. Uh, next slide, please, Marco. All right, so as you all know that EPA has certain requirements when we conduct competitions and issue an RFA. You know, one of the things is it has to be open and fair, and that's why we've invited everyone who's interested in applying on this uh, training. Uh, we also solicit for applications on our website and through grants.gov, as Jackie uh, had mentioned, and through emails. Um, currently, um, we have a role, as Jackie mentioned, that we are going to require a full federal application. Uh, for those of you who are used to the RF, 
it used to be called an RFP, um, a request for proposals, but now we need a full federal application. Um, and in Region 3, we, we had a competition in between um, for a variety of reasons, but um, so those of you in Region 3 have already gone through that. Um, and um, the, the competitions are usually open for about 45 days. That's usually the minimum to give you time to gather and, requ and get the required forms. Um, and then a uh, number of requests for funding can be much greater than funds available. Um, and even sometimes a strong application may not receive funding. But we do require that um, the um, RFA is vetted through the competition advocate and the Office of General Counsel. So there's some things on the RFA that we're not really able to change. That's something that is um, a direct requirement and is very carefully uh, vetted out. But there's always a contact person available from each of the regions. Donna, Jackie, and I are available for you to call and email with questions. That's what we're here for. Uh, we're more flexible in responding to questions regarding specific project information before the RFA comes out. Um, after the RFA is issued, we're very limited to what we can discuss beyond the parameters of the RFA. There's a Q&A section on the EPA National website, um, and that exists. Um, the link is in the um, presentation slide. And also, um, during the open RFA time period, we'll be entertaining questions and answers, and they'll be uploaded on the website as we receive them and answer them. Next slide, please. So just giving you a little bit of a sense of what the review panel does. The review panel um, members, they really take their job very seriously. Uh, we usually have about three reviewers per proposal, but no more than five. The review panel is trained with a background of the RFA and they're knowledgeable about water programs in general. In some instances, the reviewer can be from other federal agencies but they're usually from EPA. Uh, the reviewers are requested to sign a conflict of interest form, um, as does the panel chair, uh, which is me in Region 3. And the ultimate decision makers is either the division director or the regional administrator level, and they also have to sign a conflict of interest form so that there's no unfair influence in the final decision. Um, the reviewers uh, rank the applications with the criteria provided in the RFA that Jackie went over. Uh, they're also allowed to, to look at some links. So if you provide links in your uh, proposals in the time in the page limit, um, you know, they will look at those links. Um, another thing that they're encouraged to do is to look at well and program plans that have been approved and are current. Um, and if you don't have one um, at the time of an RFA, um, you might have to provide a little more information in your uh, applications in order to be current in the wetland program plans. They receive uh, information from former project officers regarding past performances um, of a grantee. But beyond that, they're really relying on information that's actually in the application and what you provide. Um, so it's really important that you you have the information that's that they're scoring you on in the criteria. Once the scores are received by the panel chair, uh, then uh, we all get together with the reviewers to discuss the the proposals and if there's a wide gap if it seems like in one area or another there seems to be some mis some misunderstanding we discuss it with all the reviewers make sure that the reviewers understand the proposal and the the sections that were included in the proposal and then if the scores 
you know, they the the reviewer have the discretion to change the scores based on the discussion if they want. Next slide. So making the decisions are pretty hard and, and especially because we always get more requests for funding than we have available. Uh, for some regions, it's even two to three times more. Decisions, we try to make them as soon as possible between three to six months. We do have time limits based on end of year requirements. Um, Unfortunately, sometimes it's beyond our control because uh, it takes some time for our uh, RFA to be approved and vetted through all the uh, through headquarters and then also through the competition advocate, as I mentioned. So, you know, just uh, we we try our best and, um, you know, we we will review it as soon as possible. Sometimes you also might be offered less funding than you originally uh, requested. Um, it could be just based on some other considerations that that uh, our de decision directors provide um, that we're allowed to do, and it's in the RFA, such as different considerations, um, such as geographic distribution of funds, um, the uh, awards between track one and two. As Jackie mentioned, we usually provide more funding for track one, but we can be flexible. That's up to our discretion. And, um, you know, perhaps there's some um, locations or areas and, and also grantees that have not been awarded in past cycles. And so we take that in consideration as well. But even with these considerations, low scored proposals will not be considered. We just can't can't uh, um, we 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 can't award proposals that are scored really low. But don't discourage if you don't receive um, if you don't receive funding this time, you can apply um, in future RFAs, and I highly recommend that you do so because. It, and also, if you get that rejection letter, there'll be a 15 day window where you can request a debriefing. And I highly recommend that you request a debriefing because at that time we'll go over with you uh, some insight on where there were weaknesses in your application so that you can improve for next time. Next slide, please. So just to recap, I know that Jackie went over some of the common mistakes. Um, for not having a successful application. And it's just really a shame that folks um, sometimes make these mistakes over and over again. And um, we want you to, to stop here, that, that these common mistakes will stop and you, you will be able to have successful applications. So some of the most common mistakes is using language that's um, uncommon and not easy to decipher and um, going on with acronyms that are not explained and work plans that are difficult to follow. Um, those are, you know, many, many people end up having those. Um, and um, many proposals do not address the purpose and need of the project as it relates specific to the stressors of your aquatic resources in your region, in your state, or the ones that you're trying to address in that project or are um, on your geographic location. Um, that's that's a big one and something that people get a lot of points off for, and I would really try to be concise in the purpose and need and also um, to really link it with your geographic location and the stressors related to the aquatic resources and what you're trying to do in your project. Uh, many times in the partners area, the roles are not given, they may be listed. Um, you know, these are some easy points that you can get if you can just make sure that you write the responsibilities of each role of each of the partners. Um, you know, are they financially responsible for the project or are they partnering with you to set up meetings? Um, whatever they're jointly doing, um, 
it's really important to do it to to or you could even put you know to be determined but it, the the best information would be to have some type of role for your partners that you're working with and we love to see partners in your applications that's always a really good thing um another one is um some people um, seem to recycle applications and, and forget to update their applications, which, um, for example, I've seen folks that refer to, um, in my region, the Chesapeake Bay program and the, the Chesapeake Bay commitments from the year 2000. And um, there have been many updated milestones for the Chesapeake Bay since then. So. Uh, really important to update your information. Don't provide old information. If you know there are new information, the reviewers can see. They can Google and look up and, and know that some of the information um, is not updated. And if you have different dates, that's really important to um, that, that we know that you've taken the time and the reviewers know that you've taken the time out to really provide a a proposal that's up to date and that you care enough to make those distinctions and and provide an updated uh, proposal. Milestones is another area that I have seen a lot of um, a lot of issues, and one is that um, no dates associated with it. Um, they miss out on specifics, like Jackie had mentioned, that it's really helpful to have. Um, not only as the reviewers to follow along your logic, but also as future project officers to be able to look at your uh, milestones and know what to expect. What's going to be provided to us? Um, is there just is there going to be a progress report submitted and when will that be? That's a condition of your grant. Also, you know, are there things that you can share some documents with us if you did a training? We also would love to hear about um, trainings and workshops and things that are being done and outreach in advance so that maybe uh, folks at EPA can participate in them. Um, and um, and also, you know, we could spread the word for you. So it's really important to include milestones um, and, you know, the uh, let's see, you get 10 points for that milestone area. So um, just make sure that that's that's something you keep track of. And also project tasks is uh, 15 points. So, um, you know, be careful about what you're putting in those tasks. Make sure that it's it's clear to everyone and the reviewers what you're doing in your project. It's very important. Um, all right, so next slide, please. So I'm just gonna quickly go over the application, the budget and management. I know that Jackie went over some of this, um, but um, at 1130, I'll stop and make sure that we have plenty of time for your questions. Next slide, please, Marco. Oops. So I know that Jackie went over this federal application forms. Real, really important that you have all these forms um, in there. Um, a, a couple of things that are not on my list that were on Jackie's list um, uh, included the um, uh, the budget narrative, which is very important, and the work plan, which is very important. Um, but they're very, uh, if you look on our EPA grant application and recipients uh, website there, there's a checklist of things that are needed for before in an application and also for a recipient after uh, you get awarded and hopefully you will. Um, next slide, please. So this is the 424, and um, I'm just going to go over the 424 and the 424A. There's some things that are important, and this can be tricky um, in this part. The 424 must be signed and dated, so that's really important. Um, we can't award a uh, application without a signed and dated 
424. We also absolutely need not only the federal amount, but the match. So um, always put both of those in so that we have a total of your full total application of a project and what you're going to spend on your total um, project. Something that would be helpful, but it's not mandatory, is that the title used in your project Oops. So um, the title used in your project, um, it's helpful if you can um, be descriptive, especially if you're continuing a project from year to year to year. Um, maybe you can identify it with um, something that's descriptive, such as like the geographic scope, or perhaps the year that the project is going to start. Um, that way it can be differentiated from past projects that you've submitted. Another thing that's very important and that project officers need is the zip codes and the geographic location. It's block 14. Many people skip this side. Um, we will need it um, if you get awarded. So it is important to put the, the zip codes. So one thing though that is is something that is a huge confusion for people always is block 19. For these grants, for these wetlands grants, block 19 must be checked off as A. Um, that's the requirement for this code of the CDFA, the code of, um, uh, I forget what it stands for, but um, our code states that you must do an interagency review. And the reason the date is important is because that starts the 60 day review period. And EPA cannot fund a project before the 60 day time period is um, completed unless um, you do get, um, if you do receive comments from your states or tribes about the um, about your project and you share that with EPA, then that would be OK. But it's an important thing to put on your application. Um, and I know a lot of people don't believe that they are required to do this, but even if you're a university, um, you need to do this in Region 3. Um, Maryland is very fortunate that they have a clearinghouse. So if you're in Maryland and you have a project, you can just go through the Maryland Planning Office uh, clearinghouse to submit your application and start that review period for the interagency review. But if not, um, such as Pennsylvania, you're going to have to look up some of the planning areas in the counties and send them to those folks separately. But it's an important way for EPA to make sure that um, states and tribes and other people who are applying for the grants and anyone who's eligible for this wetland grant that they um, are making sure that there's no duplication of these projects and everyone in your state is okay with this through your planning folks. Next slide. And I just wanted to go through this very quick and in more detail but you know one thing i wanted to say about this form it's the budget form and it's it's an it's really helpful um to put the federal amount in one column and the state match in another column it's not a requirement you can combine them if you'd wish but it is helpful and even if you have if it's not a state match but it's um it's another type of match. Um, you have more columns there to be able to put the object classes in there. It's always helpful because if there are changes that are being made, it's much easier to see what the changes have been. And um, there's another thing about this form is that there is um, a section where you're required to put in um, how you're going to spend the money, whether you're going to spend most of the money in the first quarter and then just a little bit in the last three quarters of the project period. Um, those are just estimates. You could do, you could split them up equally. I know a lot of people get hung up on those, but they're just estimates. So 
Um, those aren't really going to be tracked at all. Um, we just want to see a minimum drawdown every few months um, so that we, we know that the project's being worked on and that you need the, um, the funds to do the project. Next slide. So the one thing I want to say about personnel and fringe is that these are the direct costs of your employees for the grantee, for the recipient of this grant. Uh, sometimes people put in here um, compensation for other par program participants, for example, sub award folks or people who work in other state organizations, but that really should go in the other object category, not in the personnel and fringe. These are just for your salaried employees. Next slide. For travel, and, and just to remember, all of these categories should be explained in your budget detail narrative. Um, it's very important that you provide more information and details on all of these categories. So for travel, um, we want to know, you know, who, you know, who, how many people are traveling, where are they going, why do they need to travel, um, what are they doing, uh, are they flying, do they need lodging? Um, there's some really good uh, information on GSA websites that can help you with that, um, and the links are in these slides. And um, in other, um, again, other will include other non-employee and other registration fees for participant support costs that are from other, um, other agencies, not your agency. Next, please. Supplies. Um, the one thing I want to say here with supplies is that um, the supplies are considered if they're five, if each item is five thousand or less, um, or four hundred, four thousand nine hundred ninety nine or less, that's considered a supply. Um, even if you have a hundred of something um, that goes over five thousand dollars, if each per item is less than $5,000, then it should go into supplies. So um, you can get more information and specifics on supplies in 2 CFR section 200.94. And uh, leasing and renting services are categorized as other. Next, please. We also want you to itemize um, again in the budget narrative. Same with equipment. Um, equipment is five thousand dollars or over for one unit. So the budget unit, the budget narrative should include how you're going to procure these uh, equipment. You know, are you going to do it through a state or university procurement requirements? Are you going to do a sole source? Uh, request and why do you need to do a sole source request? So the budget narrative is important to explain uh, why you need this equipment and um, in the future, if you're awarded, you will need to give us information on uh, deposition when the grant project period is over. Are you going to keep it for the same ongoing project? Are you going to give it back to EPA or purchase it from EPA and fair market value? You can see more information on 2 CFR section 200.33. Next slide, please. I know I'm running out of time. What I will say about contracts, and let me just say this quickly, um, is that contracts are with private and for-profit firm companies. So the firm, the um, I know that some states and and maybe tribes as well. Um, in our region, we really haven't had any tribes thus far. They're all new. you you guys are all new to our region. <laughs> um, but with states, I've seen that um, some states consider an MOU or um, a um, contract with another state organization. 
they consider that a contract, but we don't consider it as a contract. EPA only considers contracts if they're from a private or, or pro, uh, for-profit company, and that's an important thing to, um, to consider when you're putting together your budget. Next slide. Uh, so yeah, you know, pretty much other <laughs> is for everything else. Subawards, you know, so subawards are usually um, other state organizations or pass through entities, sub recipients of the grants. Um, they can be nonprofits, universities. Um, and if you, you, provide a sub award of $25,000 or more to one entity that should be reported in the FSRS.gov and um, more information on the sub awards can be found on this website that is on the slide. Um, I don't have much time to go through the, the budget. Next slide, please. Um, cause I do want to get to just, um, some of the other things, but, um, you know, when you're developing your budget, you know, just think about the narrative that it has to be included in the work plan, the budget match, um, the budget match is really broken out into, f into, um, 25%. So it's not 25% of the total project, but it's actually 20, it's, it's like if you have a hundred thousand dollars of a project, your part is 25,000. So it's that's how it works. And the match requirement is listed in the CFDA for 66.461, which can be found in the SAM system. Next slide. Here are some helpful EPA guidance policies and regulations that you can go on. Please feel free to email me and call me if you have any questions. You can also find the general administrative terms and conditions that will be put on your grant um, in, in the website listed, the third website listed. Next slide. So just wanted to say about this is that it's kind of helpful sometimes to know who you're dealing with. And um, the grant specialists are the key for awarding the grants. They are required to make sure all the administrative requirements are completed, review um, them and the budgets, and they take very great care to look at those and provide comments. The project officer is the one who's monitoring for programmatic work. Uh, work plans, um, program projects, and develop the funding recommendations to, to move the project into final award. Next slide. So it's all about the aquatic resources. Just want you to remember that, um, you know, your narrative should tell the story. How did you get to this point? How, um, how do you want to improve your resources? Um, those are the important things and um, really consider, as Jackie said, get somebody to look at your proposal before you submit it and make sure that it's a, it's truly a final draft. Um, with that, I'm going to open it up to questions and just remember, so Donna Smith is there for you for Region 1, um, Region 2, Jackie is there for you and in region three i am there and we you know we'll work together too if there are questions that you can't answer we are certainly going to go to our grant specialist and get the answers for you so margaret zachariah is going to collect your chat if you have any questions in the chat or if you want to raise your hand uh, please do and she's going to read them out and uh I'll do my best to answer your questions or I will refer it to somebody else who might know that answer closely, more closely. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Thanks. Um, thanks um, for thanks. attending today. So I've been writing down all the questions you've asked. Some people have already had um, their questions answered in the chat by some of our other um, people attending but I'll read them out loud just in case people haven't been um, reading the chat and monitoring it. 
So first, we had a question asking if EPA is scheduled to move to grant solutions in the future. Um, I believe we just moved to NGGS. Does anyone else want to say anything about that? Yeah, um, grant solutions. I'm not sure if we, I mean, we use grants.gov, so um, I'm not sure what grant solution is, honestly. does Do any of the grant specialists know what that is? Um, hi, it's Michelle. Yeah, grant solution was going to be um, one of the grants replacing IGMS, but that did not happen. So um, that never came to be. So we do use NGGS now. It replaced IGMS. It's just an extension of the Grants.gov. Grants.gov is for the applicant side and NGGS is the EPA side. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. OK, um, next question was asking how different is the grant process from years past? Um, because it sounds very familiar, very si similar to the past years. Yeah, I mean, it's not a huge difference in the past. We there usually our RFAs are very similar from year to year. Some of the main changes, though, is that you need to put a full application. So all those forms before you could do just a proposal. So you could submit a proposal to be reviewed and um, you would put in a work plan and budget detail. You did not have to do all the forms required by a full federal application. But if you don't put in those forms that are required that Jackie went over, and I also had a, um, a slide on that, you will not be eligible for review. So that's just the distinction and the difference. OK, great. And then if award, um, if the awards are the grant, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble. Um, if awards are the grant money going to be split in half, should the schedule reflect on that? Um, can you read that again? I'm not sure if I understand. If awards for the grant money is going to be split in half, should the schedule reflect that? I think like if the money is going to be spread out over two years, should the schedule reflect it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think that um, definitely that would um, be something, you know, whatever you're planning to do, you should put that into your application and how you're going to spend the money. So I this is Martha Maxwell. -Dole. I asked that question because in the past we've given our timelines, but then we've you know, the, the regions awarded us half of the money and then we've had to shift our tasks and how we get things done. So that's why I'm trying to figure out how we plan ah, not to have to do that. I get it. So yeah. that is a very good question. Because we're doing two years of funding, we receive one year of funding in 2021 and one year of funding in 2022. So we can't give you the full amount right away. Mm -hmm. um, just because we don't have it. So yes, you will get 50% of the amount in year one, in year 2021. And then as soon as we receive 2022 funding, you'll get the second half. And that's also um, only if what's available. It's, it's out of our hands, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how the federal funds work. And um, usually we get our funding um, in uh, in this time period, actually, February, March. So we should be getting our funding for 2021 soon. We just have to get the RFA out. So that if you want to plan for 2022, we usually were, will be able to upload the funds and it's pretty quick and easy for us to do. Yep. Um, should be February, March. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. It just uh, people need to be mindful of that because if you have, if part of your proposal is something that you're hitting the ground year, like, like it's a multi-year, like let's say monitoring, you need to be, you have to know, a, be well aware of that so that you make sure you budget appropriately when it comes yeah, to staff that's, time. That's a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you so much, Martha. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, OK, next I have a comment from somebody saying, I believe we're going to need more specific guidance on what constitutes an interagency review, given that we no longer have that process at the state level. 
Ha. Huh. Okay. So, um, um, what's so? Here's the thing. Um, an interagency review goes um, for your. Um, um, can I just jump in? We're talking about intergovernmental, I believe, not interagency. That's a totally different. Yes, thing. you're right. I'm sorry, Michelle. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> it's an intergovernmental review, and it's usually. I mean, Michelle, you can definitely jump in here. <laughs> um, I think it all depends on who the um, because I believe that's Maine. Um, you're going to need to check in probably with Donna. All the different regions have different guidance based on the states they cover. So it would either be a SPOC, which would be simple. You send it to one, um, one central agency. But if the state does not have a SPOC, you will need to send it to the regional reviewing areas. And that's what your um, region, I believe region one, will be able to help you with. They should have the paperwork and the guidance of who you should be sending it to. And the SPOC, just to let people know, is a state point of contact for, um, it's usually a planning organization. Um, yeah. How will, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in. Um, this will probably be a common question. Um, will that be provided as part of, um, how will the applicants be able to get to the intergovernmental review um, guidance documentation since I it tends to be specific to each region. Is that provided somewhere? Um, we can look into it. We can look into I know that there's a link um, and we'll we'll coordinate together and make sure that you have that information. as a follow-up to this workshop. Okay. Um, next was someone commenting, it's unclear when the interagency review clock starts. Is that at the time of grant submission or after an award has been announced? Um, that's another good question. Usually it's, um, it can be, um, it, it's, it's recommended that you do it when you submit your application. Um, you can do it afterwards, but then that clock can um, extend the time period of trying to get your award. Um, but you can do it either um, after you know that you've been awarded or before. I've seen it have. I've seen it in both cases. It's not gonna if you don't have nineteen a blocked out that's not going to prevent you from applying and 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 being competitive but it will be something that we'd come back to you as you know which could delay the process does that answer your question yes all right <laughs> thank you um question from Beth asking how do we know who the project officer is is it different for awards that include it, that are included in a state's PPG yes that's another great question so um your project officer is usually assigned after you get um an award letter sometimes in some regions um, like in Region 3, we try and send the award letter and then you're uh, assigned at that point. A PPG, for those of you who don't know what that is, is a, per a performance partnership grant. And that's something that is um, completed in some states and tribes have them. In Region um, 3, we have one with Virginia and with Maryland, but in Virginia, um, they do put the Put it into the PPG, so the the project officer will be the manager of the PPG for the whole region. However, you'll have a technical project officer or technical reviewer that will be associated with your wetland work plan. So you'll have two. Um, so in like in our case in Virginia, we have somebody who's in our planning office that is the keeper of the whole entire performance partnership grant, which has 
many, many different work plans in it from the air division, the water division from all over. And it's a huge um, undertaking. And then the wetlands project officer will be um, helping you with specific work plan. Next question. Um, so if the state. Oh, wait, no, we already answered that one. OK, um, OK. It sounds like SF 424 block 19 will vary according to states and tribes. Do you have a list of which states would check A and what date um, submission to include? This is from Elizabeth, so she's asking about West Virginia in particular. Yeah, yeah. So Elizabeth, um, I, what I will say is it doesn't vary in that you do have to do an interagency, I mean, intergovernmental uh, review for for um, everyone has to do it under this wetland grant. Um, so that is not um, the issue, but as far as who do you submit it to, um, we will get back to everyone on that for each of our states and regions one, two, and three. Great. Um, question from Marianne. In the past, the page limit has been 20 pages double spaced portrait. Does this also apply to tables you have in the application package? Specifically, can you do the milestone schedule table in landscape and the rest of the RFA in portrait? Um, so usually the RFA states that the tables, the milestone schedule, it's all in this, it's, um, it's all within that 20 page double space portrait um, versus landscape. I mean, I, I, um, I, most of the time the RFA says that it has to be in portrait, so that's what you have to do. Um, and it has to be within the 20 page limit. Um, so I don't think there's much wiggle room there, but I can certainly look into that for you. And yeah, usually um, we do 20 pages. In the past, it's been 16. You know, it's been it's been growing. The page number has been growing. Um, Thank you, Danielle. I just wanted to mention real quick that um, although it's not finalized, the the R the upcoming RFA. I believe it might be 22 pages. That's what it says in the template we have so far. Um, although it's not finalized, but it could be, we could have increased it again to 22 pages. And and just to answer specifically, um, yes, the milestone schedule is included in that page limit. And as far as whether it could be portrait or landscape, that's the question we'll get back to you on. Just We just need to make sure that if you do put it in landscape format, that it doesn't mess up your submission at all. So we'll we'll get back to you on that. Th thank you. Thank you. This is Marianne. Yeah, I I like struggled with that last year and I had reached out to Danielle and I was like reading through all the fine print and then I kept on seeing portrait and I'm like, oh, does this apply to tables as well? And I was hoping it wasn't, but I just want it to be safe. So I did it as portrait, but it is tough to squeeze everything in. But thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll get back to you with that specific answer to that question. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Marianne. Are and the last, oh, yep. sorry. There's one last question from the chat asking if there's a time frame yet for the next RFA announcement. Well, we are hoping and we intended to send uh, issue our RFA um, in all the regions really in the springtime. So March, April time frame. Um, unfortunately, there's been a um, a hiccup um, as there do, 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 <laughs> there does tend to be from year to year. This year the hiccup is um, doing a two year um, RFA versus doing a one year RFA. And so there needs to be a briefing um, done to um, at the headquarters level to Congress in one of the um, appropriation committees so to make sure that they're okay with doing two-year funding uh we really don't want to do one year um we used to do that years ago and uh, we had to do it in region three this past year and i can tell you that 
not only is it difficult for all, from what I understand from the recipients of the grants, because you have to think about, you, know, you can't really think about the long-term planning as we have in the wetland program plans. Um, it's hard for us administratively too, because that ends up being a majority of our work and we, we would like to be able to do technical assistance and do more work for you. So, um, so stay tuned, we don't know yet. Any other questions or things that we can help you with? Yeah, does anybody who's calling in from, from a phone line have any questions? Um, now would be a good time to speak up if you have any questions and you're on the phone. Okay, um, if there are no further questions, then you know we could end a little bit early here. We just wanted to make sure we provided enough time to answer as many questions as possible. And this is not your only chance to ask questions. If you think of something later, feel free at any time to send us an email or give us a call, um, Donna, Danielle, or myself, um, depending on your region. We'll be happy to answer questions anytime. Uh, what we're going to do is we will be sending out um, a couple of follow-up items. We'll be sending out a resource document that has links to all of the things we discussed today um, that, that you need links to, such as the strategic plan, frequently asked questions, core elements framework, et cetera. There's a lot of, lot of information discussed today, um, all of which have more resources available online. We will also be compiling the questions and answers into a document and um, at the minimum we'll be sending them out, but hopefully we will be able to get them posted on the um, EPA Wetland Program Development Grants website. If you go there, you can scroll down to each region um, and there's documents under each region and then there's also um, a place where we can post it on the national website for everybody to see as well. Um, Elizabeth Byers, I do believe we will share the presentation. Um, we have not totally discussed that internally, but I don't see any issue with that. Um, this presentation has also been recorded, so we will make sure that everybody gets a link to the recording. We are still, we're still trying to determine where that link will be posted, um, but at the minimum, we will send the recording to you and then We'll also have a place where it's available online for people who didn't didn't have a chance to attend this session or the one next week. So we'll have the recording available and we can likely share the presentation as well. If anybody else has anything, any of my EPA colleagues or any final last questions. OK, I just want to thank everybody. This um, just been a long time putting this together and uh, we hope it was informative and helpful. And again, feel free at any time to reach out to your grants coordinators and uh, we will we'll get this thing rolling. And of course, we'll let you know when the RFA is announced. Um, it will also be posted grants.gov and the National EPA website and you will also get an email directly. So thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. I don't know snowing here in Philadelphia, so I'm sure it's snowing where a lot of you are as well, and hopefully it's nicer than here in some places. So have a great day, everybody, and thanks again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.